Lotus Sutra study program. This is our personal journey through the wonderful Dharma. Again, as usual, this is not meant to be an academic exercise. We're going to try and personalize it. What does it really mean to us as part of our daily practice and looking at it through the lens that uh, uh, this is chapter 11, the appearance of the jeweled stupa. And as we always do, let's go ahead and start with a, a brief a recitation of one of the passages in this, and um, I would invite you to please join me if you would. This sutra is foremost, and those who can uphold it are also the upholders of the body of the Buddha. Good children, those who after my passing are able to receive embrace, read and recite this sutra, should now pledge themselves by taking a vow in the presence of the Buddha. This sutra is so difficult to keep that if anyone keeps it even for a short while i will be pleased and so too will all buddhas people such as these will be praised by all buddhas such people are courageous and strong such people are diligent they are called keepers of the precepts and practitioners of of austerities therefore they will speedily attain the supreme buddha way in the future those who can read and embrace this sutra will be true buddha children abiding in a state of pure goodness after the buddha's passing those who can grasp its meaning will serve as the eyes of the world for heavenly beings and humans thus should all heavenly beings and humans pay homage to those who can even for a moment teach it in fearful and terrifying times and of course that's the english recitation of the hotoge um, which michael chanted uh during our service in in the japanese style so chapter 11 the treasure tower it's i think one of the most beautiful chapters in the entire lotus sutra and it uses such grand sweeping metaphors to describe our union with the ultimate concern and i'm just going to move this window so i can see there we go now, very important uh, occurrence takes place, of course, uh, the location change and somewhat as, as somewhat tongue in cheek to infinity and beyond, because now we're moving out of the provisional or historic realm of these individuals sitting on uh, Mount Sacred Eagle and we're going up into the air and it symbolizes that we're now moving from the historical provisional to the ultimate and the eternal. The treasure tower appearing from underground, rising into the air, Shakyamuni then rising up and then bringing the entire congregation with him metaphorically is inviting us to go beyond our provisional six senses, what we can see, hear, smell, taste, touch, and think, and our conventional ideas of reality, and then to see true reality as it really is, Shoho Jiso, of course, we chant that in chapter two. And this idea of to see is insight or Vipassana and what um, we also call contemplation. The 10 directions uh, represent the 10 realms. The seven treasures that adorn the treasure tower represent the seven factors of awakening. The four sides of the treasure tower represent the four noble truths that there is suffering in life, there is a cause of suffering, there is an end to suffering, and then the way to do that is to follow the path of the Eightfold Path. And then there's a part in the sutra where it says that he gathers all of his emanation bodies back together and this represents everything that we see think say do interact whatnot 
um, this idea of the whole body of the Tathagata, what we just chanted together, represents all the Buddha's teachings, practices, virtues, and merits. And then making room represents clearing our mind through calming meditation or concentration meditation. And then at the very end of this chapter, we get into these ideas of the nine easy acts and the six difficult acts. So the jeweled stupa appears. This is a picture of Mount Minobu, by the way, with a bunch of uh, my fellow trainees, shamis, uh, doing their training practice. Awakening, and this is really an important part of, of chapter 11, that awakening isn't something that drops out of the sky or that some being, you know, godlike being or deity gives to us. It's that it's springing up from within our lives. It's coming from within us. And that the ultimate idea, this ultimate awakening, this shoho jiso, it actually happens right here, right now in this Saha world, as the letter from Nichiren, um, he talked about that where he was became the ultimate. Many treasures, Buddha, who is sitting inside the stupa, represents our own Buddha nature being inside. And the two Buddhas sitting side by side together in the treasure tower represents the oneness of the provisional with the ultimate together sitting in the Dharma tower is the three truths that we learn. And then when everybody rises up, this is when Shakyamuni rises everyone up, raises them up, it's freeing all of us from our attachment. So this idea of being free, there's a lightness in that, that we rise up. And the sutra says with his right hand, he opens up the sutra stupa with a loud crack of the bolt withdrawing from the lock. And this is sort of symbolic for us to see again this insight, this, this, this wisdom that we get of the ultimate and the lock represents ignorance and freeing the lock this this crack represents the insight that comes from deep within our lives. Removing the bolt represents removing obstacles and attachments. So this is again all metaphorical ideas of, of trying to like give us this idea of what is our internal Buddha nature and it comes from within our lives. That loud crack means that this this insight this realization can happen anytime any moment and suddenly it's not something that you work on lifetime after lifetime after lifetime if you have this idea of taking faith in the Lotus Sutra that insight will happen instantly. So the more on the treasure tower. These are different versions of stupas. Um, they also have five components, which are like the five aggregates. There's the void, wind, fire, water, earth. John and Sui Lian, when you do your uh, element meditation coming up, this is, you know, this is where it's at out, it's expressed in the treasure tower. And what I think is really, really lovely, uh, particularly about this chapter, is that it's not really talking about a tower rising up in space. It's actually talking about us and our real body and the dimensions of the tower, interestingly enough, are, are two across in width and four in height and talks about that the height of the treasure tower is four, you know, 4,000 yojanas and the width is 2,000 yojanas, which basically makes this thing really big. Um, which again, metaphorically is symbolizing that enlightenment awakening is just so it's just incomprehensibly large and, and, and wonderful and expansive and it takes in everything. But if you look at the mechanics of this and the, 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 uh, the geometry of this, two to four is the ratio of someone sitting in meditation. Again, it's symbolic of your body. So how long is a yojana? There's a couple of different versions of this. They don't always agree. There's a lot of disagreement on, on it because it's so old, but it was a unit of measure that they thought a yoked team of oxen could pull a cart in one day. So the king's army could march in one day, which we think is about eight miles. So that makes this treasure tower 4,000 miles high <laughs> and 2,000 miles wide. But it just means awakening is this huge, huge thing, but it's really cool because it's really all about us and, and our own body. Again, it's coming from within, it's springing up from within. So we are the jeweled stupa tower. Um, and this is a, a letter that Nichiren wrote from Sato to Abutsubo, who was critical in keeping Nichiren alive during that, that, that horrible first winter, is in the final Dharma age, there is no jeweled stupa apart from the figures of those men and women who uphold the Lotus Sutra. 
The Daimoku of the Lotus Sutra is the Jeweled Stupa, and the Jeweled Stupa is Namu Myoho Renge Kyo. You, Abutsubo, are yourself the treasure tower, and the treasure tower is none other than you, Abutsubo. So, believing, chant Namu Myoho Renge Kyo, and wherever you chant will be the place where the Jeweled Stupa dwells. Just a beautiful passage. And from the book, uh, Two Buddhas Seated Side by Side, which of course is metaphorical for this very chapter, uh, A Guide to the Lotus Sutra by Donald Lopez and Jackie Stone, they write, by chanting the title with faith in the Lotus Sutra, Nichiren said, one is able to enter the assembly of the Lotus Mandala and participate in the enlightened reality that it depicts. Through the chanting of the Daimoku, even life's harsh, ugly, and painful parts the most adverse circumstances or the darkest character flaws can be transformed and yield something of value, becoming opportunities for further religious development. So let's look a little bit deeper now onto the character Myo, which is wondrous, mysterious Dharma. And this is idea of a portal to the ultimate or the eternal Buddha. Um, this is a it, it's 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 a doorway for us to go forth. And our Gohonzon is not a magic object. This is one reason that Michael is very clear when he's teaching us is that he doesn't like to use the word object of worship. He likes the word you know focus of devotion. But our Gohonzon is not an object. It's not magic. It's a focus of devotion to help us visualize an event and experience. And every meditation service that we do is a reenactment of this ceremony in the air with the Buddha rising up, uh, the Trevor Tower rising up, Shakyamuni and Tahoe together. And it's symbolizing that the Buddha is always present. We just have to open the door and see it. And then when we see it, we can walk through the door and participate in this. So this is a passage from our sacred service of the Lotus Sutra book itself. And I like to add it to my Gongyo service every day because it, it's so poetic. And it's from Thich Nhat Hanh. He says, when we recite the Lotus Sutra, the sound moves the galaxies, crack, the bolt opens. The earth below awakens. In her lap, flowers suddenly appear. When we recite the Lotus Sutra, a jeweled stupa appears resplendent. All over the sky, bodhisattvas are seen, and Buddha's hand is in mine. This is a, a, a quote from Jeffrey Mishlove, a licensed clinical psychologist, that I thought was, was a really wonderful description of kyo, sound and vibration, the sutra itself, and why our chanting practice which is sound based, not just sitting silently, but sound based and doing it with other people together is so powerful. And he says, there is an energy within a group experience that affects our brain coherence and consciousness, a oneness of mind, a unification of heart consciousness, a going within consciousness, developing a relationship with that one mind, that higher self, that God force, no matter what your religious belief calls it, when we do this kind of thing together, it strengthens the overall signal or sound and vibration. Why I, just, why I really love chanting, personally. Let's look at what he means by emanation bodies. Well, really, it's our thoughts, our words, and our actions. And it's what is the foundation of what creates karma. And these can be anything that you leave behind, a, a writing, uh, a piece of art, music, your accomplishments, your connection with people through your work of helping people or doing things, anything that, you know, when you go out in the world and you take an action, you, you think something, you say something, you do something, that action creates something new. And that something new then continues and ripples forth like dropping a pebble into a pond and all those ripples touch every aspect of the pond. So these emanation bodies, and again, this is all metaphorical. It's not like he's got all these bodies everywhere. It's just he's saying that every time he does something, he leaves a little part of himself behind. And if we look at the universe, the warp and weft of this beautiful tapestry is left behind, and these threads all connect together. And breathing in, we dwell in the present moment. And breathing out, we know it's a wonderful moment. 
And then gathering all the emanation bodies together is metaphorical for mindfulness, just being aware, not scattered, not out here, not down below, not not back yesterday, not wondering why you said what you said to your partner or your boss, not thinking about what you want to do tomorrow. Gathering all your emanation bodies means coming, being very present in this moment, recognizing it's a wonderful moment, being aware of your body, your feelings, your mind, and the phenomena around you, and seeing that all things are interconnected and interdependent and empty of a self nature, and then being joyful in this single moment of creation, which is yui butsu yobutsu, that two things come together and make a third new thing, but every single moment is creation. And in that creation comes from within and unfolds and comes out and radiates and we're all collectively part of this beautiful experience together, which is shoho jiso or the true nature of life. And mentioned, we chanted this too, but mentioned frequently as the whole body of the Buddha. So what is the whole body of the Buddha? It's all the Buddha's teachings, practices, virtues, and merits. And from the Kanjin Honzon show, Nichiren says, his attainment of Buddhahood is all contained in the five characters, Myo, Ho, Ren, Ge, Kyo. And that consequently, when we uphold these five characters, the merits that he accumulated before and after his attainment of Buddhahood are naturally transferred to us. So briefly looking at, we could have a whole lecture on the seven uh, factors of awakening, but these seven treasures, which adorn the treasure tower, represent seven factors for awakening. So this is kind of what we then do and how we attain awakening for ourselves. And it really begins with mindfulness, gathering all our emanation bodies, all of our crazy wild thoughts that are running astray, gathering them into the moment of mindfulness. Nietzsche talked about this as hearing the correct teaching. And it's not really like that he means that this is the correct teaching, but it's that seeing reality as it is without you know prejudice or preconception and seeing it as the raw reality, the shoho jiso. Investigation, being curious of life, being joyful to live in the moment and to you know sort of be like, wow, that's really cool. And then that Nietzsche talked about that was believing in life. And believing it doesn't mean blind belief, it means living it fully, being fully engaged in it, that you're part of life. And then energy could be endeavor or effort. And this is, I thought, this is really interesting. Nietzsche writes in these Gosho that part of this is keeping the precepts. Now, Nietzsche didn't make a big deal about keeping the precepts, but he definitely meant that living a moral, ethical, virtuous life with integrity was very important. You know, rapture, this is joy, you know, in that's engaging in the meditation of the moment, tranquility, practicing regularly, concentration, renouncing our attachments, and then equanimity, reflecting on oneself. So mindfulness, being curious, inquisitive, having energy and effort, being joyful, being tranquil, having concentration and having equanimity. These are the qualities that drive us toward really realizing our own awakening. Crack, the bolt opens up, we let go of all of those, you know, obstacles and attachments, and we see reality for what it is as it the door opens up, and we can walk through it and participate in life as it is. Now, the Lotus Sutra, normally, we talk about the first half, and the second half, and the first half was the provisional or historic, the second half was the eternal or the ultimate. And there's been arguments for centuries about which half is more important, but there's also a different way to look at the Lotus Sutra and organize it. And there, that's based on location. So um, now I'm gonna draw a parallel between this, these three parts, which was the beginning, uh, which is chapter one through the first half of chapter 11, which was they, all these individuals were actually on this mountain, Mount Sacred Eagle, Shakyamuni is talking to them. They're the historic provisional. They represent the uh, arhats of the three paths, three vehicles. And then this treasure tower pops up. Everybody rises up. And now they've moved from the historical into the ultimate. Uh, no death, no birth, no beginning, no end, where the eternal Buddha resides and where we reside all together. Everything that's ever happened in the world, 
in the universe all in this moment. And that symbolizes that now we're in space, we're in the eternal, so we're timeless outside of time and space. And then we come back again at, at chapter 22, I believe, and we come back to the mountain as a transformed community and we and then re-engage in the world as bodhisattvas. So it really was parallel to this idea of transformation. And the two halves, the provisional and the ultimate, the treasure tower rising up from that, and that they're together as one. That's And then this idea of the rituals where there are always three aspects of a rig, uh, uh, when you as an individual have this aspiration for enlightenment and you begin your journey, this is bodhicitta, you enter or you aspire to awakening and you start your journey. And now as you begin and enter your journey, you get in and you start facing difficulties and trials. This is the three obstacles and the four devils. And we're gonna talk about that at the end because it's very connected to this idea of the nine easy acts and the six difficult acts. But as you practice, we can all attest that sometimes you become depressed, discouraged, despondent. Sometimes you're happy, joyful, and alive. And, you know, sometimes practicing is really, really hard. And as you go deeper into the ultimate, you experience this transformation where, you know, during when you're abiding in this realization, seeing insight, contemplation, reality as it is, um, it can be really scary at first. And then, you know, it can be hard. So you're going through these trials. And then as you pass up out of it, you emerge uh, a transformed individual. And now you actualize how you act in the world through this transformation. And again, it's very parallel to uh, the three parts of the Lotus Sutra. The first half, which is really the aspiration, was the three vehicles assembly on Mount Sacred Eagle. That's chapter one through 11 and a half. Now we're in space, it's the assembly in space, chapter 11 and a half through 22. And then the transformed uh, community comes back down to earth, <laughs> entering into the provisional historical. And it's really all about, okay, now that we're transformed, how do we engage the world as bodhisattvas? And that's chapters 23 through 28. And uh, Michael shared with this with me a long time ago, but I, I love the quote, it's from a, a Zen master, many hundreds of years ago, and he said, 30 years ago, I saw the mountains were mountains and the rivers were rivers. Later, when I had personally attained the initiatory experience, I saw that the mountains are not mountains and the rivers are not mountains, rivers are not rivers. But now that I have attained peace, I see the mountains simply as mountains and the rivers simply as rivers. Okay, so the six difficult and nine easy practices. The nine easy actions, and this is, of course, uh, there's a, a contrast and in, in, in some, some humor in, in this, is that these nine easy things seem impossible uh, to ha actually anybody could do them. So calling them nine easy, there's this, this correlation and, and this contrast that you get. But, you know, teaching innumerable sutras, throwing Mount Sumeru to another world, moving our universe with the tip of one's toe and flipping it into another universe, standing on the highest place, the highest heaven, and to teach innumerable sutras, grasping the air with one hand. You know, who can grasp air? It's impossible. <laughs> Putting the earth on one's toenail and then traveling to heaven without it falling off. Walking through a great fire with hay on one's back and not getting burned. Teaching all the sutras and giving everyone supernatural powers leading innumerable people to our hot ship and to give them supernatural powers. So clearly these things all seem pretty impossible and they truly are impossible. But then the Buddha says, okay, well now let's talk about what, what's, what's difficult. Teaching the Lotus Sutra, that's difficult. Copying the Lotus Sutra and helping others to copy it, that's difficult. Reading and reciting the Lotus Sutra, receiving and keeping the Lotus Sutra, and then teaching it to even one person hearing the Lotus Sutra and being able to ask about its meaning and then receiving the Lotus Sutra respectfully. So those are hard. <laughs> the stuff that's impossible is easy. And you go, holy mackerel, that, what, that's crazy. I mean, it's like, how do you get your head around that? Well, maybe if we look at the Dhammapada, um, well, it, verses 244 and 245, it'll make a little bit more sense. Easy is life for someone without a conscience, bold as a crow, obtrusive, deceitful, reckless, and corrupt. It's easy, to, it's easy not to do the right thing. 
Difficult is life for someone with a conscience, always searching for what's pure, discerning, sincere, cautious, and clean living. You know, you can be asleep and you can be ignorant and full of greed, anger, and hostility, and just go forth and, you know, be narcissistic and just do whatever you want to do. Um, you know, take the dark side, Luke. Uh, that's easy. But to live a virtuous, wholesome life, it takes effort and it's hard. So when things are hard, we start with self-awareness, constantly being mindful of how our body feels, how our emotions are, and what we're thinking about and things around us. And this self-awareness is, is insight uh, or contemplation. And then perseverance. We, 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 you know, once we start, we got to keep going. Uh, Shanti Deva uh, talked about in the Bodhi Vakara that we studied. Um, he talked about, you know, sometimes maybe it's better not to start at all than to start and stop. Because when you start and stop, it's be, life becomes very hard because you've had a glimpse of how good it is. And if you stop, you can't get there. And it just doubles, it just doubles and magnifies all of the normal pains that you have. So perseverance, once you start, please keep going, have courage, have patience, have practice. And then one little tip I'd like to, to, to recommend is if, you know, with this self-awareness in your personal practice, whether it's your own personal self-cultivation, or whether you're teaching other people and you're going to run into people who are going to make you crazy and ask questions and say things that like just upset you and you start to get tired. And if you notice that you're getting tired and we all have our own signs and symptoms of what tired means, we get maybe agitated or impatient or snappy, or we want to take a nap or whatever it is for us. Listen to that, because if we don't, what happens is we become tired, we become resentful. Resentment leads to anger and anger leads to burnout. So rather than going that path, take a moment to reset, to refresh, to rest, and then begin again. And really listening to yourself. So self-awareness is the base of this pyramid, gathering all your emanation bodies back together again through mindfulness and through your practice of chanting Namo Myoho Renge Kyo and your supporting practices of Shikan that you have the self-awareness to say, how am I doing today? What's the weather pattern like inside? Am I tense or am I relaxed? Am I tired or am I feeling invigorated? And, you know, really honor yourself and put self-care first so that when you do feel tired, understand that teaching the Lotus Sutra and practicing the Lotus Sutra is considered a difficult act. It's perfectly normal. So take a moment, take your foot off the gas, maybe tap the brakes a little bit, reset yourself, refresh yourself, re, you know, rest and then begin again and keep going. But don't don't quit. And, you know, a couple of sort of mundane analogies are pilots. They know this idea because whenever pilots hit turbulence, the first thing that she does when she hits turbulence is backs off the throttle, slows the aircraft down and then starts to look for a new altitude. So that's the same kind of a, you know, a metaphor for us. We're feeling like tired. We're starting to get those signs of resentment and anger bubbling up or irritable, a little snappy, you know, it, we're hitting some turbulence. So let's slow it down. Let's find a new altitude. The other people that know this, this idea really well are athletes who know that overtraining, anytime we overtrain, you can lead to injury. And that's, that's, that's burnout. We don't want to go to burnout. So what does chapter 11 mean to us? That we are the treasure tower. From deep inside our lives arises our Buddha nature. God doesn't give it to us. Brahma doesn't give it to us. Indra doesn't give it to us. It's inside us already. It's our birthright. We, it's there. We just have to, again, we got to open the door, crack, walk through, experience that arising from in our lives. And it begins with mindfulness. It begins with making room. This is this is one reason that you know I'm so passionate about teaching Shodaigyo meditation, because it teaches us the skills that we need to deal with our little flighty, you know, rascally mind that likes to run around and get itself in trouble. And then it teaches us how to immerse ourselves in the Daimoku and experience that that eternal moment. And it teaches us how to see clearly. So it begins with making room and 
personal practice, self-care and transformation is hard. We know that. We know that there's the three obstacles and the four devils, Sancho Shima. You're going to hit it. It's, it's inevitable. So when it hits, you can just sort of say, huh, okay, got it. I'm feeling a little agitated. I'm feeling a little you know, irritable. I'm just going to take it easy today. I don't, I don't, you know, I don't need to read that extra chapter. I don't need to challenge myself to do that other 15 minutes of Daimoku. I can just say, okay, I'm cool. I'm just going to take a little moment and I'm going to put myself first. Be patient with yourself. You know, patience is one of the, the six paramitas. It doesn't mean being patient with everybody else and forgetting yourself. It's like, again, to use a pilot analogy is like, you know, when the oxygen mask falls, they always tell you, put your own mask on first, and then you can help the person next to you. And the same thing is our self-cultivation comes first, then we can help other people. If we're always helping other people and not helping ourselves, we are going to get resentful and angry and burned out. And it's, it's, it's going to end with you quitting. And then it's just going to keep going around. Samsara is going to keep, keep, keep going. Take care of yourself. Be persistent. You're going to fail. You're going to feel bad. There's a number of stories in the Nepali canon and in the Lotus Sutra where the Buddha is, you know, metaphorically talking like he made mistakes too. It was one of my favorite stories when the Buddha first became awakened. He, he was walking down the path. He sees somebody coming up to him and he starts teaching this person. And the person just looks at him and goes, huh, no. And he keeps walking on. So his first sermon didn't work. Right. And then and then he was like, well, how do I do this? You know, so it's like, hey, everybody's human. We're all human. And our internal is our enlightenment. And so everybody's going to make mistakes. It's just OK. Just make it OK. Just simply begin again. If you fail, you simply begin again. If your mind wanders off, your emanation body goes off to yesterday. It goes off to tomorrow. It's like, oh, list planning. Oh, you wake up. Ah, oh, I woke up. That's really cool. I did it. You know, I simply begin again. Breathing in. I know I'm breathing in, breathing out. I know that I'm breathing out, breathing in, dwelling in the present moment, breathing out. I know it's a wonderful moment. So everything that we just talked about is contained in Namu Myo Horenge Kyo. So that it's just when we chant again, Myo, it's, it's everything. And Kyo, it's this vibration. It's, it's, it's the whole way the universe works. Okay. And then finally, of course, my famous closing line from all of these <laughs> lectures is, does this make you want to chant more or less? I hope it makes you want to chant more. Namu Myoho Renge Kyo. That was the conclusion of the presentation. I'd love to open it up now for questions. And let me just stop sharing so that we can see everybody's happy, smiling faces. Thank you, Mark. That was great. And I can't believe you got it in all that in less than 45 minutes. I hope I didn't go too fast. Uh, okay. I was okay. <laughs> Don's shaking his head that I wasn't. So thank you, Don. John too. Okay, cool. Yeah, Veronique, thumbs up. Christina, how'd you like it? Good, good. <laughs> Okay, please, I, I'm sure you all must have questions um, or comments. Um, so please raise your hand and we'll try and get to them all. Thanks, Doug. Bye. Max Maxwell. Thanks so much. That was amazing. This was such a good lecture. I really appreciated it. Um, and uh, my only question is like, I really love this part about like self care and like, not like pushing yourself too hard um but also like where like for me i know like self-discipline like if i just need to like make myself and if i like if i get into those um kind of depressive moments where i'm like oh no i can't even i don't even have the energy to chant sometimes that could go on for like days or weeks where i'm like so where when do you push yourself through mm. you know is there a good time to know that maxwell it's a really insightful question and I don't have an answer for you other than only you can answer that. Um, I, I would say, and, and, and I've gotten a few questions from, from some folks about well, how, do, how do I establish a practice? Um, what I would say is that we have to, each one of us find our own equilibrium in practice. Um, and that the most important thing is that a practice has to be regular. So you do have to have a regular practice you can do every day. 
And regularity is a way of building habits. And when you hit the Sancho Shima and you hit the depressive, uh, anxious moments, uh, your habit patterns will help you get over the hump a little bit. Um, and so it's important to like pick a time. So yes, meditate. And I'm going to say meditation because meditation is in nature and meditation includes chanting, which is our primary practice. And it also includes sitting and Shikan style meditation, which is our supporting practice. So mm -hmm. I'm going to say meditation. I mean, chanting. Um, so we should chant should mm, ooh, hate that word. Uh, ideally, uh, we we create space for ourselves to chant every day, twice a day. And because of habit, because we're creatures of habit, it helps to make it a regular time. And so is that first thing in the morning? Is that last thing at night? You know, is it after breakfast? Is it before dinner? It doesn't matter. It's twice twice a day. You you create space for yourself, self care for your own. Per this is just for your personal cultivation. It's not for anybody else. It's just for you to give loving kindness to yourself. So regularity is really important. Try for twice a day, make it regular, make it consistent. Now, here's the real secret, Max. Maxwell. Um, shorten up the time that you commit to yourself to do self care and, and, and be super candid with yourself. Like, what can I do every day in a I'll, somewhat tongue in cheek without pulling a hamstring, right? Um, like, is it five minutes twice a day? Is it 10 minutes twice a day? Um, one of the things that used to just absolutely wreck me when I was in the SGI, and I'm not criticizing the SGI, was there are 1 million Daimoku like campaigns and that you're supposed to chant an hour a day. And I was like, I don't know how you do that. <laughs> and, and, and when I didn't do it, I felt like crap. And I was like, I was just constantly like this self reinforcing that I'm not good enough. So what I say to people is, if five minutes twice a day, five minutes twice a day is better than one hour of Daimoku a couple times a week. And then if you're feeling good, add some stuff to it. So, so deconstruct your practice into the smallest amount that you can do every day, twice a day, regularly without killing yourself. And then when you're feeling good, you can add things to it. And so now pr creating a practice, it's just like going to the gym. Practicing is for our mind. What going to the gym and working out is for our body. And you would never go out and try and run a marathon if you've never run before. You wouldn't want to try and you know bench press 200 pounds if you never bench pressed anything. So you start small and you, you know, our mental muscles, it's, it's a muscle, you know, we've got concentration, which is calming, we have clarity, which is Vipassana insight, you've got equanimity, and then you've got, you know, sympathetic joy or, you know, and loving kindness. And so you build these muscles up a little bit at a time, a little bit at a time. And if you if you get down five minutes twice a day, and you're doing really good with that, and you're not missing anything. And by the way, if you do miss, don't criticize yourself, there's no self judgment, no criticism, it's like, okay, I missed. I'm human. It's hard, right? Nine easy acts, six difficult acts. It's hard, but start small. And then when you're feeling good, build up. And then over time, like just, just for a month, do, you know, 21 days builds habits, they say, right? So five minutes, twice a day, then 10 minutes, twice a day, then 15 minutes, twice a day. And then if you're retired and want to be a priest like me, then you're up to an hour a day. Um, but you know, you gotta, you know, we're all, most of us are lay people with lives and children and, you know, siblings and people we care for and children, whatever. So we, we have to like fit this in and we have to do it in a way that prioritizes self-care, but doesn't make it a burden where we start to get resentful. Um, and if you are feeling really bad, um, that's what the community is here for, you know, pick up, pick up the phone and, you know, or text, text me, text Michael, text anyone else that you know, say, I'm really struggling today. We'll, I'll, I'll, I'll finish with a final thought um, is that the Lotus Sutra and the practice of chanting Daimoku is the perfect combination of self power and other power. And as we learn from uh, Master Tian Tai is that when we single mindedly and wholeheartedly chant Namu Myoho Renge Kyo with humility, um, repentance, deeply trusting and confident, 
in Myoho Renge Kyo as if our lives depend on it, for we know that the, all the Buddha's practices, teachings, virtues, and merits are contained in Myoho Renge Kyo. And when we chant Namo Myoho Renge Kyo, we too, our beautiful lotus flower will blossom and bloom, the door will open, it'll rise up and it will come from within. And, you know, all of the Buddhist practices are contained in Myoho Renge Kyo. That's Myo, the wish granting jewel. So thank you all very much. This is Shami Ryugan White Lotus, also known as Mark Herrick, student of Reverend Michael McCormick from San Francisco Bay Area, saying goodbye, wishing you, may you all be happy, may you all be well, may you all be peaceful, and may you all be at ease. Let's conclude with three Daimoku. Thank you.